Righty ho everybody, so here's some last minute revision on the costume question. Now just remember when you get there and you open your paper and you look at your costume question, make sure that you circle the name of the character whose costume you are designing. Remember they might say something like design a costume for Mickey in the scene where Linda or design a costume for Mrs. Lyons in the scene where Mrs. Johnson, whatever that is, you circle the character who the costume belongs to. Next thing that you do then, folks, is you go and you open your book and you open to the specific part in the play that the, co the costume is for. Very quickly make a read of it and then that will give you the, the information that you need, the contextual information that you need to begin your costume idea. Remember, the first thing that you write down is the name of the character that the costume is for. You write down the period and position in the play. So it might be Act 1, 1960s. It might be Act 2, 1970s. It might be Act 2, early 1980s. And then you write down their status. So the status will be working class, if it is um, Mrs. Johnson, if it is Mickey Johnson, if it is Linda, if it is Sammy. And it'll be middle class, if it is Mrs. Lyons, if it is Mr. Lyons, if it is Edward Lyons. Okay, so when you're thinking about your costume question then, key things to remember. Think about the colour, what colour you're going to use. Remember the colour just needs to be alluded to, you just need to write the name of the colour, you don't need to colour it in in that colour. Is it going to represent a particular aspect of their personality or a particular place that they might be in at, the, at that particular time psychologically? We'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end when we're looking at specific colours. Think also too, you must make sure that it reflects the time period. So we need reference to the time period in which this particular extract is set. So be clear about that folks, be clear about the time period and make reference to the style of that time period. You need reasons um, to show how this costume portrays some aspect of that character, that character's personality, that character's situation, that character's relationship with themselves, perhaps, or relationship with others. We need a clear sense of status and class. It has to be there. Of course, it's going to be stereotypical, but the, we do need to know that this is the costume of a working class person. This is the costume of a middle class person. Remember, when you're talking about costume, that does cover not just their clothes, but hair, accessories, makeup, and any additional accessories that might be needed for the actor's needs in that particular extract, where they are at that moment in time. Think about all of those things together. Think about colour and shape and material. Think about the weather. Think about how they wear their clothes. Are they having a sense of pride in their appearance? Do they care about their appearance? Do they... Um, wear their clothes in a way to indicate that at this moment in time they're in a rush or, on a or in a panic or on a date and remember all of those things that justify the choice in relation to clothing will not be in your sketch they will be in your paragraph okay so let's look at other things that might affect costume choices right Think about external religion uh, reasons uh, and influences. For example, religious um, references. Mrs. L L Mrs. Johnson is religious, okay? She's religious. She's a Catholic, so she may wear a crucifix. She may wear a cross, or she may wear a crucifix, which is a cross with um, the figure of Jesus Christ on it. Um, also, too, remember that fashion is there, and it's the fashion of the time period. Remember, are they young? Are they old? Does the costume perhaps um, link to a particular desire that they have? That You know, you had mentioned before about um, Mrs. Lyons wearing um, a locket, Mrs. Johnson wearing a locket, um, those sort of things. Also remember the, the need to acknowledge the actor. What does the actor need? Is there a particular property? Is there a particular prop that they might need in that scene? And remember, it'll be a quotation from the extract that will allow you to work that one out. You need to have a complete understanding of the different elements of the character. Are they pre proud or vain or shy? And remember, if they are, the key thing is you have to make it relevant to that moment in the extract. Okay, It's all about that moment in the extract. Not about how they are elsewhere, but how they are in that moment in the extract. The top range candidates will use their imagination. And by using their imagination, they'll pick elements of the clothing that might relate to relationships 
in the extract and perhaps elsewhere. So, for example, some of you had mentioned the idea about Mickey might ha might be wearing something that was his dad, something left over from his dad. You talked about the idea of his dad maybe having a national service medal and and Mickey wearing that because he wants to show his pride, the pride that he has in his dad, how he wants somebody to be a dad to him and he doesn't have one. Or, for example, the relationship between Edward and his father. Edward's father is very proud of having a son and heir, and so there might be a particular heirloom that Edward has, particularly when he goes to university. When they are separated, he might want uh, a way of remembering his father, and so he might have a pocket watch or, or something like that. So anything that relates to relationships. The more specific you are in relation to the detail, the higher your mark. Please remember there is a specific structure that has to be followed. The sketch will have the labelling. The detail will be written on the, the labelling um, in terms of identifying on your sketch what is there. But the reasons and the justification for what's written on your sketch, they'll all be in your paragraph. So when you think about um, a sketch, you think about labels. That's all that you're going to be doing on the sketch. But when it comes to justifying why you have those labels, labels, why they're there, then that's what you're going to do in your 100 words of your paragraph. Okay, now when it comes to the costume question, all the big hitters need costumes. For example, Edward's going to need one and here you can see there are some occasions where you might want to think about costume choices for Edward. Initially when you see him in Act 1, when he's 7, you're thinking that's about 1967 perhaps, when he first meets Mickey. Um, also that idea that when uh, he has the Peter Pan shooting scene. Now, that doesn't mean that that costume isn't the same as that costume. Um, those two costumes can be exactly the same. I'm, I'm just putting it out there. Um, you also have the idea that that takes him up to the end. When he says goodbye to Mrs Johnson, that takes him up to the end of Act 1. So that takes him up to about 1967, end of Act 1 for Edward. Okay, so by the time we get to the start of Act 2 with Edward, Edward's about 14. So if we think that the kids were born in 1960, so the start of Act 2, we're thinking about 1974. And there you have the opportunity to see Edward dancing with his mum when he first meets Mickey as teenagers again when they're, they're younger. University, we're thinking about university being about 1978. Um, then the light romance with Linda, we're thinking that about that being about 1982, 83 perhaps, and then of course that's when they die. Mickey, exactly the same. He's going to be seven, it's going to be 1967. Opportunities to have costumes there you can see in Act 1. Okay, Mickey, 1974, the start of Act 2. You can have an idea of the sort of costume choices that you might want to think about there. Big ones for Mickey in relation to that would perhaps be looking at Mickey when he gets married or even looking at Linda when she gets married. Look at the stage direction. It makes it very clear that for Mickey, he gets married on the way to work. Um, therefore, it's not going to be a top hat and tails jobby. And therefore, that might be an interesting one for you to think about. And then, of course, that takes um, Mickey to the prison scene and to his life on the pills. And there you're thinking about the early 1980s before he dies. OK, Mrs Johnson. Now, the first time you see Mrs Johnson, remember, that's her at the end of the play. So the very first time we see her around about 1983, at the end of the play, when she's saying, tell me that's not true and her, her boys are dead. And then when we first see her um, in terms of Mrs. Johnson being a young woman who has just been left by her husband, you're thinking about the very late 1959, really start of the 1960s, um, for her to be pregnant and to give birth around about 1960. And again then, Mrs. Johnson in Act 2, you've got those things. I've just maybe mentioned to you, there are some times where she's optimistic. For example, the start of Act 2 is a more optimistic Mrs. Johnson and perhaps you want her costume to um, reflect that. Also, it's a Mrs. Johnson who's got herself sorted out economically then because she realises that she's just buying stuff from the catalogue that she doesn't need. She realises that and she doesn't do that any longer. So that might be reflected in, in her costume that she's more secure. Okay.
Uh, Mrs. Lyons, again, it's exactly the same for her in terms of dates as it is for Mrs. Johnson. We'll first see Mrs. Lyons round about um, 1959, 1960. Uh, and we'll take her all the way up to the end of Act 1, about 1967. Then we start off... Then we start off with her in Act 2, so you're thinking about 1974 there, um, before she um, lets them know about the light romance, and again that will take you to about 1983. Okay, now there are other characters that you're going to need costumes for. Linda, Sammy, Mr Lyons, he was on last year. Now these last three I've done in a little group together because... They can ask you questions on costumes in relation to minor characters. And in this respect, the finance man is a minor character, the judge is a minor character, and the narrator. Now, I can't see them asking you really much. I really don't think that they could ask you on the finance man or the judge because they're, you know, they only appear um, once. Um, however, the narrator is a possibility, so we'll talk about that now. Okay, so if you have a wee look, ooh, drawn a wee line there. So if you have a look at this um, PowerPoint here, you can see that the narrator, um, he, his role is like that of a Greek chorus, where you don't really need to know too much about that. But what it is, he's there to explain the action on the scene, uh, that's taking place on the stage. And he gets involved by asking the audience to judge what he sees. However, when he is um, on stage in professional productions of Blood Brothers, he's usually dressed in exactly the same way. So on stage, he's dressed in a black suit, gives him a neutral status so that we cannot ident identify anything about his character. So this is why I don't know if they could ask this question, because you can't really develop character on the narrator. He, he isn't a character. He's a neutral character. But anyway... Um, if you can see here, it gives him the status. He's almost like ghost-like, a bit like the inspector and inspector calls, really, in that respect. Um, his role is always such that allows him to be dressed exactly the same way. He's dressed as if he's dressed for a funeral, always in black. So, again, I can't see them asking you this. I don't think you could develop his characterisation. I don't think you can develop the characterisation of the finance man or the judge anyway, but I'm just covering all bases. So let's have a little bit more information on the narrator then. Okay, so if I were to dress the narrator, then what would I do? I'd put him in an expensive black suit, possibly a cotton mix, because it um, gives him this idea of uh, him being separate and different from the world of Mrs. Johnson, the fact that he's in an expensive suit. Um, it allows it to be, by allowing it to be black, then you've got this idea that it links to death and mystery. That are in, a, in relation to actual actors' needs, it means that he can remain hidden on stage, um, but always present, omnipresent, and that is what makes him such a sinister um, character. The crisp cotton shirt is white to give this professional image, which again is in contrast with the world of Mrs. Johnson. Black tie, thin, because it's professional and timeless, and the narrator is a timeless character, not part of any fashion or decade, giving him this ghost-like appearance, otherworldly appearance. Shiny black paint and shoes makes him seem detached from the world of poverty and struggle that Mrs. Johnson is stuck in. He could have an expensive watch, maybe a Rolex. It's symbolic of... Um, that he places time limits on the characters' lives, that he's linked to fate, he already knows what time will do, and he knows when the time for the characters is up. He can check the, his watch often to remind the audience that time is precious. Hair, dark and sleek, almost that of a stereotypical villain, suggests that he's an ominous character in the piece. He has no particular style because he doesn't belong to a particular time or pace. Clean sh shave and gives him a sense of smoothness and authority and control and perhaps maybe a gold tooth to show he's menacing and to link the idea to wealth, which is part of this part of the thematic um, role class has within the, the play. So those are the things that I would do if they asked us a question on the narrator. Feel free to use them, but the key thing is I don't know how you can develop too much from him as a character because he isn't really a character per se. But just in case he came up, there you go. Okay, the judge, again, because he isn't much of a character, there isn't very much you could do here, but this is a picture of a stereotypical judge. You can see that he wears red robes, and those robes are um, usually made out of a, a very good quality material, so perhaps they'll be made out of a very 
um, exclusive uh, cotton. He has fur on the collars of it. This wig is, is made out of horsehair and they're called full bottom wigs. Okay. Um, he would have a stiff and starched collar. Okay, there. Um, but again, there's not much that he can, maybe there you've got that idea, he's got a, a gold ring because he has wealth and power and control. Maybe those are the sort of things that you could say about him. Finance man. Now, everybody did the finance man. You did the finance man. And I also printed out four really good examples of the finance man and gave them to you to ask you to identify what was good and what could be fixed in them. So we have the fi finance man covered. And I'd ask you just to go back and have a look at them. However, if you just need uh, another reminder, maybe the finance man is going to wear something like he's wearing a camel coat. Very popular in the 1960s. Um, with men who wanted to appear to be professional, even though they weren't. Um, he'd also perhaps be wearing this sort of flat cap. Again, it gives you the idea of his working class origins, even though his coat and his tie perhaps suggest that he, he feels his status is, is better than those um, who he deals with. Remember that it's the finance man's job to be the debt collector, so he works with poor working class people all the time. He is part of the working class but feels more important than they because it's his job to collect the money off them. So that might be something that you'd like to think about. But I just urge you to go back and look at the copy of the finance man that you've already done and the four copies that were photocopied and given to you. Okay, so what we're going to look at then, folks, is fashion ideas particular to periods, because remember, that idea of reflecting status and period is so important with your costume questions. And the first thing you can see will be particular costume designs from the very, very late 1950s and the start of the 1960s. Now, the first thing you see there, look at these skirts. They're called full skirts. Okay. And the reason why they're full skirts is because they, they are filled with material. Sometimes they have net underneath them, like this one here, to make it stick out. But it's just an awful lot of material used to make one skirt. And what it's doing is it's copying the Dior look, D-I-O-R, uh, the Dior look that came out in the 1950s. It has a very tight waist to accentuate the, the female figure and that tight waist is held together with a belt usually a, a, a belt that will either be contrasting or like here this black one with the um, yellow dress or a belt that will be part of the design itself here you've got a blue tartan belt with a blue tartan skirt so you'd have that tight waist that would be important for Mrs Johnson remember she looks like Marilyn Monroe and so she maybe want to have that hourglass figure and this clinched in um, type of dress will do it hourglass okay figure now if you look at it in terms of status for Mrs Johnson she's going to be wearing something like this but perhaps something like this that she has made herself it'll be a homemade Perhaps she's cut it out of a simplicity pattern, and I'll talk about simplicity patterns later on. So it would be a homemade job. It'll be cheap cotton. Um, it will perhaps be a colour, one colour, um, or a dullish colour um, to reflect the idea that she hasn't got access to the best materials. It'll not be accessorised to the same extent, extent as somebody like Mrs Lyons. Mrs Lyons will be able to afford something like this in silk or in satin in a bright colour. She'll have matching accessories such as the long gloves, such as the pillar box hat, maybe such as the velvet collar on the dress and the velvet on the sleeves that you might have here. They'll be wearing court shoes, C-O-U-R-T, court shoes, perhaps with a kitten heel, a little small heel, and they'll usually be black. They'll be leather, or they'll be, oh, it'll be leather for Mrs. Um, 
lions. And perhaps for Mrs. Johnson, it might be leather too. They're her one good pair of shoes, but they'll be scuffed, they'll be worn. Perhaps she'll have mended the soles with bits of cardboard, that sort of thing to see her through. Okay, so here you can see simplicity. Now remember, in the 1950s and the 1960s, um, an awful lot of people made their own clothes. There weren't the same sort of shops that we have now. For someone like Mrs. Lyons, she would shop in a boutique. Okay, and a boutique is a shop that does designer clothes, high-end clothes, um, clothes that would be inspired by the catwalks of, of London and Paris, but they would be made to measure and she would buy them in a boutique. In a boutique. They would be expensive. Um, for Mrs Johnson, she wouldn't have that opportunity. She could get her clothes by making them from a simplicity pattern and tell them it's a simplicity pattern and that she makes it herself, makes them herself, or perhaps she would get them from somewhere like Kay's C K A Y S Kay's catalog, and Kay's catalog allows her to buy clothes and to pay them off monthly, and that might be some way in which she could afford something a little bit better. Now here we have the 1960s. So this is um after the babies are born, taking us right up to the end of Act One. Now what you notice here, skirts are above the knee, um. Dresses have changed. They're no longer clinched in at the waist with the full skirts. These dress types are now called A-line. Okay, so A-line because they look like letter A, if you can see there. You've got high collars. Um, you've got um, that idea of bright, vivid patterns and swirls, very 1960s, um, almost psychedelic, um, vivid swirls. Now, if you think about it, Mrs. Lyons is a middle class woman. She's quite um, refined. She's quite dignified. So she probably wouldn't want the brightest, swirliest pattern. She'd maybe go for something quite plain. Maybe the white and gold here with the high collar. Hair in a sort of Grecian style bun. Big earrings, accessories there, perhaps to show her wealth. And kitten heel shoes. Kitten heel shoes that you have here. Um, again, she might be wearing nice tights she could be wearing um tights that are um silk uh, she could be wearing um the the idea of expensive shoes nice belts chain belts very popular in the 1960s driving gloves or sh um short white gloves again very popular in the 1960s she could, she could be wearing something like that now, for Mrs. Johnson, what would she do? She'd have one of these. She'd make it herself. Of course, the material's not going to be um, that good of quality. It's not good. She's definitely not going to have satin. She's definitely not going to have silk. She's not going to have linen. Those sort of things that are um, open to Mrs. Lyons. She might just have cotton or polyester, something like that. Something that's hard-wearing, something that's durable. But she's going to be aping that style. She wants to mimic that style. Okay, so here we have a picture from the 1960s and what we've got is an image which allows you to see working class fashion um, in the 1960s that would do Sammy or Mickey any time in Act 1. So you've got plimsolls, there you have white plimsolls, very common in the 1960s. They're quite scuffed, they're quite dirty looking and when you're thinking about the plimsolls, plimsolls, okay, um, they're, they're soft, a bit like gutties, a bit like um, trainers that maybe that you would see now. Also then, uh, they're soft-soled and they're made out of canvas. So they're canvas plim canvas plimsoles, okay? And they're white and they're scuffed. Be They'd be the sort of shoes that you would use in school and outside school. Then you can also see the other boys. If we have a wee look over here. These boys are wearing leather shoes. Of course, they're scuffed and they would be shoes that they would wear to school and outside of school. So you'd probably just have your one pair of shoes that would be school and outside and then you'd maybe have a pair for Sunday best. But we would just say that they're using well-worn leather shoes, maybe even pass-me-down shoes, shoes that wore Sammy's that are now Mickey's. Okay, um, short ankle socks there, knees quite dirty. Um, Knees quite dirty there because they're always out, rough and tumble, live outdoors, don't often live in the house 
when I um, go into the house for meals and bedtime. They're street kids and so you might want to have uh, scuffed or dirty knees. The other thing too, um, they have trousers cut up as shorts. So these would have been at some point uh, full length trousers but then as the boys get older cut them up to shorts and turn up the, the hems of them to show maybe your mum has done that. These ones the hems aren't even level, you know one's a little bit longer than the other. So you might want to say something like that, that the hem, the hems have been turned up by Mrs Johnson um, so the boys get extra wear out of them. You've got here a shirt um, and this shirt here is open necked. Uh, again, quite popular in the 1960s and also v-necked woolen jumper, again, quite popular in the 1960s. Also that idea that might be wearing a checked shirt just to um, show that they're outside, it's not their school uniform. Hair, hair is usually quite short. Um, it's uh, short here and then they've got a little bit more hair on top. It's called a, a crew cut. And you've also got the idea of maybe a middle party, maybe even have a little bit of hair gel or something like that on. Um, maybe it, that would be more applicable to Act 2 when they're a little bit older. That's really up to you. Um, this boy has a watch. I've just drawn over the watch, but he has a watch. Maybe it's his dad's watch. Um, the belt, nice and tight. High-waisted trousers, nice and tight because that's the fashion of the time. So we don't have any low trousers where we can see people's underwear like we do now. Um, and that might be something that you want to, to point out. So really, when we're thinking about what they're wearing, you're thinking about material, you're thinking about polyester, you're thinking about cotton, you're thinking about secondhand clothes, perhaps um, not from a secondhand shop, but just passed down through the brothers. You're thinking about alterations that have been made by Mrs. Johnson to get an extra bit of wear. You've got those open neck shirts um, and the V-neck jumpers, maybe scuffed, uh, sorry, uh, the, the cuffs of the V-neck jumper might be slightly worn, could have stains and you've got the idea that the boys are a little bit scruffy not because their mummy doesn't love them but because they're outside all the time. Okay fashion in the 1960s for men, middle class fashion here you can see two businessmen the important thing is that they would have a three piece a three piece suit and that means they have the jacket the matching waistcoat and the trousers. Trousers here, the legs are narrower than the boys that you've seen earlier. So they're narrow trousers, a uh, drain pipe, drain pipe, narrow leg trousers. Um, you're thinking here about suits. So you're thinking these suits are made out of a, a good quality tweed. You've got a cotton, best sort of cotton would be Egyptian cotton. And you've got a cotton shirt, well starched starch okay so a well starched collar I just put an ed on it for starched and uh, everything ironed everything precise everything matching hair perfectly combed to the side parting clean shaven and um, the idea that they would wear cufflinks perhaps they've got the handkerchief perfectly folded and in, in the top pocket that's called the breast pocket ties are narrow in the 1960s um, they'll become fatter in the 1970s um, you've got the idea too that shoes would be good quality leather well polished righty ho this would be a middle class school uniform in the 1960s um, and in the 1960s boys mostly wore shorts to school like you can see this fella here so you would have the shorts um, and you'd have the blazer the blazers in, in very posh schools the blazers would be um, as you can see here striped and quite colourfully striped um, and it could be any colour at all. We've got green and red and yellow here. You've got a matching cap, a matching blazer cap. You can see both boys have it there. Um, and you've got the jumper and you've got the school crest on as well. Hair, this, this hair is called a bowl haircut. Bowl haircut, very popular in the 1960s, and 1970s, 1980s. Um, and you can clearly see here that would be something that would be done in the hairdressers. And for the working class boys, their hair is probably going to be shorter um, than it would be if you were a middle class boy. You can wear your hair a little bit longer there. Everything's precise. Everything's the colour of the school. Tie, blazer, uh, cap, good quality leather shoes. Probably one of the companies um, that would have been very popular in the 1960s for shoes. Company that's still popular called Startright. Um, and that's right, R 
I T E. Starbright shoes, perhaps very well polished. Okay, daywear in the nineteen sixties. Um, what you have here, two piece suit. Now remember, the men have the three piece suit, women have a two piece suit. Um, this is a Chanel look where you have the round collar, uh, and the shorter sleeves, and that's Chanel like this. Chanel look two piece suit. And what you have also then would be the shorter day gloves that are white. You can see that um, two of the four women here are wearing them. Um, it was about keeping your hands not just clean, but keeping them soft, looking after your hands. And so Mrs. Lyons would wear day gloves like this. Um, if she's not wearing the A-line dresses that we looked at previously, you've got again that hourglass figure that we saw in the 1950s with the tight waist. But what we have here, the skirts are shorter they're to the knee or above the knee. I would say that Mrs. Lyons would probably be just to the knee. It's uh, that look that she'd be looking for. Um, and you've got also a haircut here. In the 1960s, the bobs came back, a bob haircut. It came back. Um, and you, this girl here seems to have a bob and this girl here seems to have a bob. Um, makeup is very natural looking there that you can see. And checks and polka dots were very popular in the 1960s. And so that might be something that she'd wear. Then think about your accessories. You've got bracelets, you've got wedding rings, earrings, handbags, all of those things very popular and could be used to um, suggest those connections with other family members, particularly her wedding ring or maybe she's wearing some jewellery given to her by Mr Lyons, maybe uh, a lovely gold locket or or maybe she got a particular ring or a particular um. Uh, bracelet when she gave birth to Edward because there is a tradition for husbands to buy wives jewellery when they have children. Okay so this takes us to the 1970s so we're thinking here about act two and we're thinking about the boys as teenagers and as young men. Now 1970s an awful lot of denim denim very popular in the 1970s and for boys and for girls we've got flared trousers so those bell bell bottom trousers bell bottom trousers um you've got really tight tight waists very popular in the 1970s and high waist look how high that guy's waist is it's almost like simon coyle so high-waisted bell bottom trousers with a tight belt Belts would maybe have an ornate belt buckle. You can see this guy here has quite an ornate belt buckle. What they would wear with those then, they'd wear tank tops. Tank, T-A-N-K. Tank tops, as you can see there. I'll just rub that out now so you can actually see what they're wearing. Um, and a tank top is a woolen, it's a woolen vest top. A bit like a jumper without sleeves. And tank tops could be colourful. You've got this one here, lots of different coloured stripes, very popular in the 1970s. Scarves, again, woolen scarves, very popular, and longer woolen scarves. In the 1970s, there was a Doctor Who, I think it was called Tom Baker. And he was a Doctor Who, and he brought out a fashion for wearing very long woolen scarves, you know, scarves that would maybe go down past your knees. And this guy here has a very long woolen scarf, as does this guy, and it's um, wrapped around their neck several times. Now, in uh, Edward, when he comes back from university, he is wearing his college scarf. Um, so it's not a hand-knit woolen scarf. It's like the, the scarves that the seniors wear in our school. And it wouldn't wrap around your neck all that many times. Um, so just be aware of that. Duffel jackets. Can you see this jacket here that has the fur and wide collars, really wide collars? Um, a duffel jacket with a wide collar would be something that a young man would wear then. Also, you've got this man here who's wearing a suede jacket. Um, you have shirts. Shirts have really wide collars, um, collars that almost touch their shoulder. It's a very popular thing in the 1970s. Hair for boys, long, really long and curly. It can be or really long and straight. But long hair for boys, very popular. And of course, boys in the... 1970s they're going to be wearing shoes and their shoes are platform so oh can't write in that platform shoes so um, platform shoes would be worn by men and by women uh, in the 1970s and badges can you see how he's got a, a badge there on his jeans badges on jeans badges on coats very popular in the 1970s 
Okay, for women in the 1970s, so for Mrs. Johnson or Mrs. Lyons in the 1970s, huge trousers, huge flared trousers that you can see there. Perhaps that's something that Mrs. Johnson might do in the 1970s. She might move into trousers. Trousers are about practicality and they're also about power because, you know, when a, a woman who's wearing a pair of trousers is a woman who, you know, that she can she can do whatever she wants. She doesn't have to be worried about her legs or her skirt. And so maybe Mrs. Johnson might wear flared trousers to show that she's reclaiming her power in, in Act 2, that she's in control of herself. You've got here blouses, blouses tucked in to skirts, blouses tucked in to trousers, blouses with those wide, blouses rather with those wide collars that I told you about before, look how wide that collar is. And also they have puff, puffed shoulders, so puffy sleeves and puffy shoulders. It's um linking back to a look that was brought into the fashion world by Laura Ashley, Laura Ashley. Now, that needs a big capital A. Laura Ashley was a quite a posh clothing range in the 1970s. So Mrs. Lyons perhaps would be wearing clothes that what she could have bought in the Laura Ashley shop. Mrs. Johnson could not have bought them. But remember, maybe she's not buying her own clothes or she's not making her own clothes like she would have been doing in the 1960s. She's got a bit of money. So perhaps she's buying her clothes from popular shops in the 1970s like C and A which would have been a very popular shop in the 1970s, C&A, or um, Little Woods. So she maybe she's not buying from the catalogue anymore, remember that, because that was one of her problems in the 1960s. So she's buying from High, high Street Fashion, maybe from C&A. Um, and also in the 1970s, you've got the idea of lots of beads and longer necklaces, um, and the idea to shoes, if you can see there, platform shoes as well. Maybe Mrs. Johnson wearing um, platform shoes, give her a bit of height, add to the increased status that she has in Act 2. She's getting her life back together. Right, lots of images here just of children's clothes in the 1970s. Those are the tank tops that I talked to, to you about earlier. And you would wear your tank top with your wide collared shirt underneath. And they were quite brightly coloured as you can see here. Uh, variation on a tank top, a boy's waistcoat here, and tank tops with knitted belts, if you can see there, also tank tops with patterns. Um, the idea too for the 1970s, now remember all of our um, younger characters in the 1970s are teenagers, so they would be wearing fashion that, that's um, linked to the idea of being a teenager. They started to make teenage fashion in the 1960s and the 1970s. Um, Girls would be wearing um, little short suits, you can see here, or they would be wearing, this is a blouse that has quite a lot of, uh, of frills on it. Frilly blouses would be popular then. And also collots, if you can see this character here, this girl here. Collots, now collots are making a bit of a comeback. Collots look like a skirt, but actually they're trousers and they come just below the knee or on the knee. Collots and knee boots would be very popular in the 1970s and knee boots would, might be something that perhaps um, Linda might wear. Maybe she would like to wear collots because she's got that tomboy element to her character but also she's becoming increasingly aware of her femininity now that she's a young teenage girl and she's starting to feel attracted towards boys and belts and long necklaces long necklaces with maybe a charm or something on the end of them. Also polar necks with long necklaces would have been very popular in the 1970s. Okay, so this takes us to the early 80s and the idea of unemployment and the idea of um, young men who are perhaps dressed casually because they're not working. Um, now, when you can see here, what you see in the 1980s is more of a sporting influence. So you have a lot more focus on casual sportswear in the 1980s than you ever had before. So we have um, Adidas or Adidas, whatever way you want to say it, um, trainers. These replace the, the gutties that we had from the 1960s. We have zip-up jackets, and you can see here. Um, lots of jeans or chinos. Um, and also to the idea of wearing sportswear um, top and bottom. So you wear a sports jacket and you wear um, those sort of casual sports trousers. Also too, 
you would wear jackets. This boy here seems to have a coloured leather jacket. Coloured leather jackets were very popular in the 1980s. Now, how would Mickey afford one? He wouldn't. So it would be fake leather. So it would be a, a leather jacket, but it would be fake leather jacket and it would be coloured in keeping with the 1980s. Um, you also too would have the idea that um, shirts would be tucked in. They'd be tucked into your trousers and then you'd wear your zip-up jacket um, underneath. You've got polos, uh, um, polo shirts, polo, P-O-L-O, -O. polo shirts with the top button done up would have been very much a mod fashion in the 1980s. Hair is a lot shorter, men are clean shaven um, and also you would have um, v-neck jumpers there with a polo shirt underneath. Okay. Here are some lovely ladies in the 1980s. So we're thinking perhaps about Linda and Mrs. Johnson. Now, one of the things that you notice about the 1980s, they've got puffball sleeves, okay? Dresses seem to have puffball sleeves. They have very um, bright patterns and bright colored tights. So the list, this lady has blue tights and a blue dress. That wouldn't have been um, popular before the 1980s. Also, permed hair. Um, so that's just... P E R a perm and then E D permed hair, um and curly fringes oh my yes curly fringes, um lots of satin, lace tights shoes are flatter okay so you've got flatter shoes they are called court shoes. But with a, a a flat heel, um, and also the idea that you've got um necklaces lots of accessories big earrings big necklaces, big volumized hair lots of eyeshadow. Um, all of those things popular. Shoulder pads, shoulder pads really popular in the 1980s. Maybe Linda would have a dress or a jacket with shoulder pads on it just to show that she has the increased status and the power in the household. You know, she's the breadwinner until she gets Mickey a job through Edward. Might be something that you'd want to mention. Okay, so finally, finally, remember with your character, Make sure that you're focusing on the specific character, the character name. Tell me, are they working class or the middle class? Tell me the period. Is it the 60s? Is it the 70s? Is it the 80s? Remember, if it's Act 1 and it's the boys, you're thinking about um, their 7 and it's 1967. Act 1 finishes about that time, 1967. Act 2, the boys are about 14, so you're going to think there that it's about 1974. And then it, that will end about 1983, 1984. Just think of it in terms of the boys being born in 1960 and so the women being pregnant in 1959. That will give you um, your opportunity to, to work out what is the decade that you're writing about. Remember, the middle class people are the Lyons family. Everybody else is working class. Remember, is your what's your character doing in that specific extract? Are they in a hurry? Are they relaxed? Are they under pressure? Are they working? Are they not working? Is it school? What do they have to do during the scene? Is there anything that the actor might need? And try to adapt the clothes in that way. Think about the layers of their personality. Think about that. So um, work out what could they be doing with accessories or hair or makeup. Um, is there something in the subtext? Is there something being suggested? So for example, Linda's tomboy nature, is that suggested through the use of the cloths? Um, think about the material, what could that convey? Think about the use of colour as well. Try to be imaginative. What accessories, makeups and hairstyle would that particular person um, want to adopt in order to make others think of them in a different way? Do they want to be part of a particular scene or a particular group? Just a last wee minute uh, reference to symbolic use of colour. Think about reds, lust, danger, love, desire, blue... Think about green, think about black, think about purple, all the different connotations there. Think about white as well and also too think about the, the state of, of the, the clothes. Are they clean? Are they well pressed? Are they mended? Are they handmade? Are they shop bought? What shops did they buy it in? Was it a boutique because it's middle class? Was it CNA in the 1970s? Was it handmade from a simplicity pattern? Think about to the type of material. Is it acrylic? Is it something artificial that's hard wearing and durable? Could be brightly coloured, cheap to buy. Cotton, natural light, comfortable, wash as well. Needs iron though. Is the person going to be ironing them? Mrs. Um, remember if Mrs. Lyons sacks Mrs. Johnson, does she get a new cleaner who irons things? 
Um, cotton can be elegant and it can also be affordable. Egyptian cotton is the most expensive cotton. Therefore, that might be something that Mr. Lyons would have. Linen. Linen is natural, but it's expensive. It has to be tailored. It's quite summery. It creases easily. It needs looked after. You certainly wouldn't have anybody from the Johnson family in linen. Polyester then, look at how it's spelled, P-O-L-Y-E-S-T-E-R. Polyester, cheap, common, durable, used for children's clothes. Tweed, natural, expensive, old-fashioned, tailored, upper class, um, middle class. And wool, warm, natural, hard-wearing, can be home-knit, cheaper, will suggest above old age for children. So a woolen scarf knit for someone because um, want, you want them to be warm and to show that you love them. Okay, so best of luck. I hope there are some ideas for you and really just think about making sure that on that sketch all you do is label and then you do the justification um, in the paragraph. Remember, remember, you need quotations from that specific extract in the paragraph. You need them. Okay. <laughs>